Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a beautiful Wednesday evening. Welcome to Looking Deeper. And uh, for for everyone who's listening, wherever you happen to be this evening or this afternoon or this morning, wherever it is that you are, the chat room is open and you are invited to join Sandra and myself inside the chat room uh, for some discussion about the reality of life's challenges or the challenges of reality. Good evening, Sandy. Good evening, Dana. How are you? And hello, everybody. Well, we finally got some rain here in West Michigan, so that was a good way to begin the day today. How are you doing? Oh, we, we've been getting wet. We've been having thunder and lightning storms, but boy, we needed it because it was dry. So second cut of hay was kind of on the back burner, and all the plants were like, feed me, uh, water me. <laughs> and, uh, but it's good. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, pre-fall more, uh, uh, evening. The uh, crickets, I, this, is, this is exactly, talk about reality. Every single year of my life since I've been a student going to school, no matter what year, and living in New England. Oh, the coyotes are not working. Oh, I don't know if you can hear those. Oh, wow. Um, August brings the crickets in New England. And that sound is so nostalgic because it means it's going to be cooler, you can open the windows, and you have to get ready for school, and summer's over. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're winding down winding down so i'm sitting here on the deck and right to my right there is that half moon and the coyotes are howling and the crickets are clicking and uh i'm sitting here and that that sky is silvery blue with that dawn out there and i'm ready to go excellent excellent so hey linda grizak it's great to have you in the chat room tonight come on in everybody the water is warm the water is fine, as they say. And uh, tonight, Sandy, you picked the topic. I did. The challenges of reality. What was it about that topic that, that drew you? Well, a lot of it has to do about the atmosphere that the politicians are bringing in or the way that protests are happening, the way that climate change is here. The way that our world is really facing so many different realities and the fact that they're spoken of by so many different interpretations that when does one see the fact or when does know what is real and how do you face a reality rather than I, the denial or the lying or the spin doctors or or or. And so I'm wondering, how are we finding our own reality? How are we facing our own reality rather than being blanketed in some delusion or having to belong to a group, a group and have a consensus of they say it isn't, so therefore it's not the pandemic. I mean, the reality is there's lots of different realities for all sorts of people right now. So... What makes it real? How do we face it when it's really real? And what makes it real for anybody? Well, those are great questions. And how do we handle our reality? Because there are so many ways right now in modern society where we don't have to face reality. We can go into a cyber reality or a various other, a spiritual reality, so many various realities that we can dip into and sometimes just stay right in rather than face our own reality. So maybe we should talk about why it is that sometimes we avoid our reality. Where does that come from that we're not taking a real hard look? Oh God, well the list is long. Uh -huh. Pain, suffering, uh, denial, uh, the resistance to, the need not to believe, the fear base, what's going to happen, uh, you know, the neurosis of trauma. Uh, reality is, is sometimes so harsh that our nervous system even shuts us down from having to experience it. 
So, you know, what happens when the adrenaline kicks in? What happens when the going into shock kicks in? We can have emotional shock. We can have physical shock. We can have, um, you know, the shock of our consciousness. We have the breakdown. So there's all sorts of techniques to avoid reality or have reality removed in a way that one does not have to deal with it. And, and, and so I'm wondering why, and I really mean this in that place of why are we so frightened of reality? What, what keeps us out of reality? Mm -hmm. Why are we a civilization that doesn't want to believe there are bears in back woods? <laughs> well, it makes us uncomfortable. It, it plays on our fears. It plays on our less feeling of less than. Um, it plays real, really on fear. And when we aren't looking at reality, it doesn't mean that if we're not looking at reality, that reality isn't still looking at us. <laughs> End the <of> show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Because if we're not going to face it, you know, it continues to tap on our shoulder. It continues to infil infiltrate our lives, and it affects our lives when we don't look at the look at reality. Um, Todd Francisco is in the chat room. Hey, Tara, Lady Hawk, hey, Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Hi, Lady Hawk, everybody. Yeah, what Linda Grizek. What a wonderful bunch. Todd is saying. Reality may not match the story we tell ourselves and others. Well, yeah. And that's a big one. That's a big one, you know. And, um, it, well, Todd, why do you say that? <laughs> <laughs> seems like, seems like I've heard that a few times from somebody. <laughs> I'm <Same>. a teacher. <laughs> With social media and so many ways to portray ourselves, sometimes I do wonder, are we portraying ourselves um, in an unrealistic manner on purpose, or do we really believe what it is that we portray out in the world? Oh, well, that's, now you're talking uh, deep psychosis, deep uh, social image, uh, self-esteem, um, how to get along, how to belong in the clique, how to hide. Yeah. It's really amazing how many masks we can create to avoid what it is that one is really truly feeling inside. It is a gutsy, gutsy, gutsy person that can really hold their own in this is who I am and therefore this is who you get because of the consequences of how does that work in the real world. Because mm -hmm. you may come up against somebody that goes, uh, here, kitty, kitty. <laughs> right. You know, me too. And it's that place of, I know in the personal work that we offer, in the spiritual work that um, has become so incredibly, um, not just popular, but sought after. And that is, how do we find the reality of our own being? after being told by our parents who we have to be, or told by our teachers what we have to be, or told by society what we can't be, or accused of something that you don't even know what it is, that now you're being punished for being it. I mean, the trauma that initiates that, that who do I look like so that I can just even be safe or belong, I mean, that's, an, that's a staggering, staggering process of achieving an identity and and even now in our society where most women aren't allowed to even get past 23 without cosmetic surgery or implants or um you know something to deny them the right to mature mm -hmm. so you know personal work or that spiritual quest to find out who we are or why we are, I think we're being driven by that because we're thirsty to stop playing the game. 
I like and, that. Yeah, I, I mean, that, as I say that I can hear my own paws, um, because right now the game is so overwhelming. There's there's hardly a place we can go and dodge the game because of social media, because of the onslaught of our own newness to the society of like, computers. and um, I, I mean, I know I'm addicted, and I don't even use it that much, but it's like, what's in there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what's there today? It used to be the TV, you know, after work or, you know, during dinner or after dinner, but but now our, our, our senses are saturated with information. And how do we even have the reality of what the sensation is that we're feeling to what the media is giving us? How do we feel the truth? How do we feel reality? Do we choose it? Right now, I know a lot of people are choosing reality or choosing a reality. Right. There's so many options. Yes. And, you know, I think one of the things for me when we talk about reality and getting real and abstaining from realness there's a price to be paid for not being real or facing our reality. And there's a liberation, I believe, um, that comes with facing the challenges of just being real, the reality of who we are. I know for years people have asked me, uh, Dana, have you ever been chastised for being, you know, this mystical person that sees spirit? And I can honestly say that never publicly have I been, been chastised. I've had conversation about it. And I've educated myself about what it means to be a seer, what it means to be a sensitive, and known my entire life that I'm different from a vast majority of people. Um, and that has challenges that comes with it. But there's a liberation, I believe, that happens when we walk through the challenges of those conversations. So do you mean to tell me that you can really see dead people? Do you mean to tell me that you really believe in angels and that spirit talks to you? You really believe that? Why? And I consider that just to be conversation, but for some other people, that conversation in whatever text it concerns their life is so frightening that they will withdraw into an unreality and create a reality, as you said, Sandy, that serves public opinion or f family or community. Did that even make sense? Or religious community, absolutely. Or religious community, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, right now the climate is so fierce to claim an identity, especially on you know, social media, Facebook, or Instagram, or TikTok, or this. I mean, everybody's putting out a facade. Everybody's putting out some type of, look at me, this is where, this is what I am, or this is what I, I want to be, or whatnot. And if there's anything I know about anything, it's that even if you put out the best of who you are, the projections on you may not be reality. And so how someone perceives us or perceives me, just like within you, you know, I do this. How am I perceived? Well, somebody may go, whoa, and somebody may go, whoa. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, like, that's pretty outrageous. And isn't that wonderful to uh, grow up in the call the lynch mob? So it's, it's interesting how, how do, and I can, I can be honest, going through my life, and the more and more I would get into my spirituality when I would be confronted because I got into it in the 70s and it was still not popular. It, it certainly wasn't as common day as today. Right. And, and so the way it was observed was as bizarre, strange, spooky, creepy, um, <laughs> you know, you're, you're different. Uh, what do you think you're doing? Or what do you mean there's energy in rocks? And um, the speculation of the reality was their reality was more important because I didn't necessarily have the ability to prove what I could see. 
I mean, how do you prove I see dead people? I see, how do you prove that to the person that's asking you? Unless you're going to do a reading and you go, well, how is that? And then you get scared to death or they want more information. <laughs> Been there a few times, yeah. Right, you know. And, and so, you know, what I'm also talking about is how do we even have a gut reaction to what is real? You know, when does our gut tell us something is real? Or even when it's, um, right now, there's that time of, oh, I'm going to say before when I was growing up, there was an instinct of, if I say who I am to these people, I'll be in more trouble than if I don't. Yeah, I'm just looking as you're speaking in the chat room, and uh, Todd is talking about, um, it's amazing. What's amazing is that with social media, you would think reality would be harder to avoid. Yet people so often then choose to say it's a false reality and continue to create their own version. Well, yeah. To which Catherine, our Lady Hawk, follows up with, I have been thinking about masks a lot lately. We have been working on removing our masks and then we have to wear one. To me, social media is like a mask for some, and they can portray what they wish things were like. True. Say that last part again. To me, social media is like a mask for some, and they can portray what they wish things were like. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's the reality of also facing, and we've been talking about this, how do we, what is the reality of finally coming to terms with someone, if not yourself, is addicted, is drinking, is on drugs, is, is you know, doing things that are bringing harm to themselves and contaminating and poisoning the environment of a family. How that, that in itself is a hard reality. Yes. To really believe, I smell it, I see it, I can, but do I believe if I say you're doing it and they say no, who do I believe? And I think it's really important to know that there is that level of sanity where you can be talked out of what is the truth when the person that wants to offer the lie can out talk you. Oh my God, yes. Projection, projection dismisses reality all the time. Absolutely, Sandy. I'm a little verklempt at that whole, that whole place that you just took us. That's right. We can know reality. We can feel reality. We can sense and taste reality. But if somebody is able to present their reality or what they wish to portray reality as, I think sometimes we call it gaslighting, um, we can doubt ourselves and what we know to be real. And therefore, I have a feeling it's because we don't want it to be real, or we hope it's not real. Yes. Or the consequences of having it really be real means we can have to make a, dec a decision about it. <clears throat> and that's 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 probably where we're really going with everything. Is like if we really know something's real, then what are the consequences of it, or what do we decide about it? Right. If we know it's real, then. How are we responsible? How do we interact? If we stay separate or we stay disjointed, if we stay in denial, it's like, did you see that UFO? Uh, not really. You didn't see the flash in the sky? Uh, oh, is there a flash in the sky? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> right. And there's that, you know, and there's and, and, and there's that thing of in reality. Are we trained as children not to have one? Oh, that's a good question. Linda, a, Linda Grizak is adding, the chat room is very busy tonight, Sandy, so I'm just going to... Go um, right ahead. Hello, everybody. It's safe for me. <laughs> There's quite a chatter going on, which is wonderful. Linda Grizak down there on Sanibel Island is saying, being real entails being aware and awake to who you are and knowing why you are here at this place in time, then relating to the world around you accordingly. Be true to yourself, to which Todd says, preach on, Linda. And then our dear friend Tara Reitberg here in Grand Rapids adds, 
Time is the great unveiler. It's hard to maintain a false reality or mask because sooner or later the truth will out. We're all hoping for soon. <laughs> That's what Todd just, <laughs> Todd just typed that into the chat room. <laughs> Right. <clears throat> well, it is amazing because as children, you know, think about how a child asks a question and you're too young to understand it could be the answer. Or, no, that's not what's happening. Are you sad, Mommy? Are you sad, Daddy? Is Daddy mad? Is that, no, 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 no. It's just this, you know, oh, we don't think about that. And so, you know, our, our gut instinct, our primal intelligence asks things and seek answers. And what is sad is when we ask something that is really blatantly clean, to be told no, it doesn't dis doesn't exist. It discredits our own learning bar. That incredible antenna that we have that goes ding ding, this is something and this is what it is. And then we reach out as children and go, um, I feel this or I know this and you go, No, you don't. Right. And, you know, it takes a lot, like, it takes a lot of courage for a child to stand up and go, but yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And, and, and to hold the reality. And I, I, I mean, I can remember sitting on my bed lots of times going, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that wasn't just what was going on in the house. It was also what was just going on in the atmosphere around my bedroom. Because the dissertation's already then, and mommy, I see this or I see that, or there's that. That's over the corner. I mean, as a spiritual child, not knowing I was, the boogeyman became the label for a lot of entities that were there that didn't have to be haunting or negative or, you know, made my fault for seeing them. And now everybody else is scared. Right. Well, and Jessica Clark in the chat room. Hey, Jess, it's good to have you in there tonight. She's an educator, as you know, and she's weighing in saying children often know their truth and a greater truth. I find they often call people out, which makes people really uncomfortable. <laughs> and Todd is adding, and they can so often be our teachers when we let our ego go and let them. Yeah. <laughs> know how do we reinforce it for them even if their reality is uncomfortable for us as an adult right it, how do we surrender that space of yes you're right yes you're right if the reality of that that rightness is uncomfortable for the adult or for the parent or for the you know the person that they're confronting mm -hmm. and I know Many times I had the right answer, and I was told, you know, you know too much. You're a smart ass. Who, who do you think you are? Oh, you always have to be right. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> like, you know, after a while, it's like, okay, yeah, I am, but I'm, I still want to be your friend. <laughs> I still want to belong to a family. <laughs> and it's that place of how, how do you survive when the reality is so overwhelming even to call time out. Right. And as Todd is saying, and I, I think this is a really great point, that when we shut children down um, to their own unique ideas and wisdoms, what it is that they know, they simply then to be, they begin to parrot their parents. They just repeat right. what they've been told because that's sufficient and that keeps them safe within the confines of, of the family <laughs> ideals. And so sometimes I believe that our own ability to trust our reality or our intuition, our sense of knowing is challenged early on. And sometimes it's challenged early on on purpose. You will continue to repeat the family mantra because this is what we stand for and this is who we are and this is how we've always been and this is how we're always going to be. Because if we don't follow that line of thought or thinking or speaking, we become what? 
the black sheep of the family. And why is it such a bad thing to be the black sheep of the family is my question. Ah, well, it depends on who the parents are and the rest of the siblings and how you're going to be affected by them. Because if you're the black sheep, you can be abandoned, you can be isolated, you can be dismissed, you can be punished, you can be excommunicated. I mean, the list is long. You know, but if you're gutsy and ballsy and, you know, have an attitude that does not have an attachment to the people, then you become the rebel, then you act out, then you leave, you leave home early, and then it's like, you know, you put on lipsticks and a short skirt, and you go out and you handle the day. So it depends on the, the interior of the individual of how their survival skills kick in. And it's, uh, it, 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 and the reality, I mean, coming back to how, what happens when reality ch challenges us, it's that place of, is reality important to be fair? I don't think reality is always fair. Well, I know reality is not always fair. Right. And so it's hard to face reality. How many times do people come to you? and said, this is what's going on, and it's just not fair. It's not fair, but it's not fair. Mm -hmm. Well, just because it's not fair doesn't mean it's not going to go away, or that it will go away. Right. But it's not fair. Or, you know, my, my, my husband's family, their basic line is, well, that doesn't make sense. And it's like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, for whom? Right. For whom? For whom? And I think that's mandatory for us, and this is one of my stock answers to most everything, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. When they really show that, and that is one of those places of reality that when someone really shows you who they are, it takes guts to believe them. And then know it. And then that's when we have to become responsible and accountable for that's the information that's the truth. Now I know it. I can't be shocked anymore. Not in, why are you like that? It's like, oh, there you are. There you are again. And that's where that personal reality comes in of what will I do with this rather than always hope they will change <clears throat> or be what I want or, or um, <laughs> get out of the way. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Reality is not always a nice thing. And so I think we've conditioned ourselves to be comfortable. And, to get comfortable. and don't you feel uh, Lady Hawk and Jessica uh, are talking about the fact that, you know, challenges, the challenges of our reality are often gifts. And I don't mean that in a cheesy way, but the challenges are, I think you often refer to it as the rub yeah. that refines us. It's the rub that helps us discover who we are, why we are. And it's the rub or the friction that's gifted to us by the challenge in order for us to become even more well, it's a real. Word. Yeah, it's a generous part of the, the new age, uh, you know, definition of, well, I just fell down and broke my leg and the gift of it is, you know, rather than, oh my God, the inconvenience and the this and the that. And that gift part is really, how do we integrate? How do we see the bigger picture? Um, what just happened and why? You know, how, what, how does this benefit in the long run rather than just be cranky and, and, um, feel like, uh, you know, everything always happens to me. And, or it's unfair that it happened to me. So they're that gift of, you know, again, we are only in maybe the last 10, 15 years that we're really asking why as a learning curve, as a popular way of doing it, um, you know, maybe 25 years as a learning curve, as an option, because you know, the A house went out there and said, maybe this has happened, or um, S and everybody else said, if you have cancer, you created it. It's like, wait a minute, what? 
And so there's this place of what reality is for me or the challenge of reality. Now, I'll be bold here. The weather, the reality is it's no longer a theory that something's changing. The reality is there's change. I don't care what anybody calls it anymore. Mm -hmm. There's change. <laughs> so the reality is it doesn't have to have a certain context to it that uh, if somebody agrees with, well, it's not called this and it's not called that. Well, it, we can't call it this, but we have to call it that. Everybody's so busy trying to call it something or to believe it's the same thing. In the meantime, tornadoes are in my backyard. Mm -hmm. you know, hurricanes are lining up. There is people, the fires, I mean, the reality is it's happening. Something extreme is happening. And it's happening fast and it's happening consistently and it's bombarding us. So oh, I, I, I really want to ask everybody in the chat room, how has reality changed for you in the past six months because of COVID? What, what has happened with the reality of we no longer can just assume something and guess what's real with it? What's the reality of it? The reality of lots of things. I know that if there's a fire outside, the reality is there's a fire outside. I lived in the woods. The reality is when there's a bear at your door, there's a bear at your door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and what do you do? Do you wait to get proof from somebody else that it's real? Or do you own your own interaction with something? I mean, one of the greatest moments right here in my house was on New Year's Day, where I'm sitting on the sofa with Bobby and uh, my sister-in-law sitting right across from us. You know the dining, the living room. So they're sitting in the chair. Actually, she's sitting on the floor. We're having our brunch. And so we're all having a little champagne and orange juice. And she looks out the window over our shoulders. And she goes, oh, my God, look at all that fog rolling in. And so for her, reality is there's a white mass of a cloud rolling right over our yard. And she goes, look at that fog. And I look over and I said, that ain't fog, that's smoke. <laughs> and there was a fire. And in that moment, that reality is in, in the interpretation. What are we seeing? What do we think we see? How do we trust what we see? And what do we do when we see it? I mean, that's a long list of questions. Somebody jump in. That's a really long list of questions. And what is it that we see? What have we been trained to see? What have we been taught not to see? Well, the, the very first time I ever saw smoke clouds, interestingly enough, was when I was in California. And it was at my very first gathering to do uh, readings. I was invited to do some readings and I was in a gymnasium and out the window was this huge volume, this cloud in the sky. And I, as my New England self, look out in the sky of California and say, oh boy, we're going to get a thunderstorm. Look at those clouds. And the woman goes, goes that, that, that's not thunderstorm, honey, that's fire. It's like, and my brain went, what fire could make something that big? And it was the, the first time I ever saw land mass fire. Mm. It was the first to hung a fire. And, you know, and then everybody sits there and houses burn and the ash comes down and sits in the pool and they live with it. I mean, that's the other thing. How do we get accustomed to what reality is and adjust? Mm -hmm. Okay, to go to your question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my hubs is answering <laughs> during COVID. What has been so clear is that our, our society can't survive on just social media and TV. I see people all the time at work via zoom continue to get slowly burned out 
and then completely revive after a week on vacation where they got out among people and nature. Yeah. I think we're all finding that uh, the reality of having people in our lives that we can see and touch and smell and converse with, um, the reality of not having that so accessible has really brought home to many people the reality of how much they need it and nature, right. being out in nature. I agree right. with that completely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm lucky enough to live in nature. I've lived in nature most every single day of my life. I'm lucky enough to know how to isolate, but I also know how to associate. And there's that place with social media is really a very, very new dimension for communication in the long run. And yet there's generation people that have been brought up on it. And I am from the old school. So there's something inside me that understands what it means to touch. And I come from a family that touch is important. We were able to touch. And that agape love means it's safe to touch somebody. It's safe to reach out. And there is that need for human touch. I mean, think about how many people don't have somebody in their life. Get an animal, or they have an animal. And that animal is, is our touchstone. It is that, it's the warmth, it's the beat of another heart that we need in order to feel that we exist and mm -hmm. are loved mm -hmm. and can love. Right. Linda Grizak is, is agreeing with Todd. She's saying, I agree, nature is the key, being in nature. And we live here in the forest as well, so we're very blessed to have this space uh, to come and go and to be out in nature every single day and to be able to commune with that. Um, Lady Hawk is answering your question in this way. Well, I see the challenge of a new 906, 906 unit property just built on a beautiful spot with water and my best buddies for 15 years, the Hawk, Taya and Victor, the Vulture. It's hard, wonderful work, four stop signs from my home, and I wonder how I will create a safe place for people to store their belongings. Wow, 906 units. All that's happened during COVID. That's really something, Lady Hawk. That's quite a change. Lord, 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 Lord. So what happens with that, Lady Hawk? Yeah. Does she have a response? Yeah, we're going to put that question out there for her to answer. Uh, for me, it's been wonderful because the kids have come over. And, you know, to be able to have Dane and Melissa and Colton and Audrey and Matt and Elise and my grandbaby, Easton, um, for me to be able to be present for all of them and to have them here has been nice. And at the same time, being being, you know, smart about the fact that uh, Todd has been through his own health challenges in the last year, uh, as has Easton. You know how that is in your household as well. And so being conscious about who I touch or who I'm in touch with is new for me. Because I'm more discerning. I'm more awake yeah. and aware of what I may bring home to Todd or to Easton in a vulnerable place. And before where I would avoid somebody who obviously had the flu or bronchitis or something like that with COVID, it seems to be much more hidden uh, from what I have learned about it. And therefore I've become consciously awake and aware of who am I touching? Who am I allowing to touch me? Which is so different for me. Right. I mean, you know, we see each other, we jump in each other's arms. I see people and say, oh, hi. And so that agape love, that organicness, my natural being reaches out. And I have the same scenario. Bobby is compromised, and if COVID gets Bobby, he won't, won't die from leukemia. He'll die from COVID. And, and there's that place of my soul can't bring that home to him. How do we, to, to be careful about where we go, 
how we go. And New Hampshire now has really gotten very, 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 very clear that the stores put right out on the door, mass required. So, you know, it wasn't before, but now it is. Mm -hmm. And we are very, very low in our cases. I mean, we're still in the yellow zone. But for myself personally, there's that reality of I, I do everybody on phone or on Zoom as a client. I mean, I'm grateful over these past 10, 11 years that, you know, I've been learning how to do it anyhow. And now it's, it's a, it's easy. And yet, interestingly enough, people are starting to say, could I come with a mask? Mm -hmm. Can I, they want to be in person. Yes. There, there is that, can I see you? Can I be with you? Mm -hmm. And I can honestly say, you can come through this store, go to my office, go back and, you know, sanitizer, mask, blah, 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 blah. And there is the, cra I live in nature. So for me, I've got a pool, I've got the animals, I've got this, I've got the mountains. I'm very, very, believe me, I am so, so grateful that if I wanted a venture, all I had to do is step off my back deck. Exactly. And, and, and to know that I also live with someone that is gracious in our intimacy. So we touch, we, we, we're cozy. Um, I'm not starving for the human touch. And we have deep conversations. So I'm not, you know, I, I have my women's groups. It's that place of, I know I thirst, like you and I talked about, for a quality of conversation, a quality of intimacy. And we have been driven neurotic mm -hmm. with going, you know, how do you touch? How do you, how do you smell? How do you, how do you have, I mean, think about our pheromones. Right. Jessica is weighing in. Um, she's saying, I feel a split happening with people that I know. Some are going deeper into the insanity of social media, TV, fear, or they are taking the time to honor what is important to them and makes them healthy. Well said. Yes. Bravo. Well said. Because it's, there, there's a reality right there. And that reality, the challenge of that reality is we are being spoon-fed neurosis. We're being spoon-fed terror. We're being spoon-fed into that primal place of you better watch out because it's coming. And how do we challenge that with, wait a second, something, something, something else is real over here. What is speculation? What is real? And I think also what is real is what's in your backyard. If you're on the streets of a, of a community that's in an uproar, that's real. Yes. I mean, if you're somebody that's getting pulled out of the car and shot at, that's real. And that's real for you. If your skin's a certain color, you are compromised. That is reality. And, you know, I'm a white chick sitting on the back deck uh, in the coziness of my home. So there's a lot of things that aren't real in my everyday environment, but they're real outside my external world. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk tonight about the fact that because we may have differing or different realities, does not negate somebody else's reality. Exactly. And that's big to that's take a big. look at somebody else's reality. Sometimes we refer to that as walking a mile in their moccasins. Right. But just because my reality may be different than us, my siblings' reality of even how we grew up in a household, let's just say, my experience, their experience may be very different, but it doesn't negate the reality of the experience. Can we talk about that for a minute? Let's go for it. You and I both know that people can grow up in the same household, the same set of parents, and become completely different people. And the reality of what happened to them in a household 
can be very different and neither one is is right or wrong they're both right based on their reality of a situation so right. how do we deal with somebody let's just say that went through an experience with us and they're retelling or their experience of the experience is so vastly different whose reality is right sandy Yeah. You're talking you you're talking about sibling rivalry. You're right. talking about politics. You're talking about competition. You're talking about he said she said. You're talking about what you know, um, husbands and wives. You're talking about the aspect of the dynamic of who's telling the story, who did it happen to, who wants to hear it, who needs to see it, who can't even say it and it happens to them. And who's willing to believe it because it's going to get somebody else in trouble? I mean, you're saying something that generates so many options of experience or expression or controlling of the situation. Mm -hmm. That, And I just want to finish this. Like, in my own family, I live with an older sister who, no matter what I said was the truth, it was more important for her to counter it. And that is mind-boggling to know that I could, I, something happened to me, something was real, I would say it, and it was like, no, it didn't. I didn't say that. No, it didn't. And it, it's like, and then the fight starts with, why are you lying? Or why? And then how does a parent choose what reality is real? Or accept? And how do you get your reality to be believed? I think that is one of the greatest issues of my existence, to have my reality be believed. Excuse me, but how many people have ever told you, you're exaggerating? That didn't happen. That couldn't be real. Too many? I don't have that many fingers and toes. In any <laughs> lifetime. In any lifetime. <laughs> Yeah. And the reason that I want to talk about it for a minute is because sometimes people's reality and their experience, the challenge of their reality and their experience in that challenge is negated. It can be negated. And I just wanted to talk about the fact that sometimes we have to be the last person to look in the mirror at night and say, we know what happened. We know what's real. And to be okay with it and go to bed. We can't always fight it. Make sense? Oh, good God. Um, I'm going to, um, I've got a text here. Um, this is one of the greatest moments of reality I have ever lived in my life. I was in New Mexico. I've told this story. And there were three men on the property. And I went out by myself. I'm, on, I'm in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. And, you know, 300 acres of property and then several thousand uh, acres of land before you find another person uh, that, that I'm with. And when I went outside, I turned around because I heard a noise. And through the window of this little bitty cabin, there was the silhouette of a person in the window. And my mind couldn't quite figure out how did my silhouette get on that window? It was, there's the door with a window, and right across from the door was the window, and behind that was the, the uh, excuse me, the street light. And my brain couldn't figure out reality for a quarter of a second. And then the shadow moved. And I went, <laughs> I'm not alone. And it's one something in the morning in the middle of Mexico. I quietly went back into the house, la, 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 lots of things happened. But what happened to where I want to get to quickly is that when I got the person on, the other person on the property that was out in the cabins to get to me and we're in the house and I've got a knife and she's standing there, she asks me, are you sure? Are you sure there's someone out there? And I could, I could actually feel my, adre my adrenaline start to cool down. And I didn't want it to be real. And I remember so clearly saying, Sandy, you have to remember what you saw. And 
and to remember how I track what happened. And from one person in a window to two people on a deck, the next day when the police came, they said it was three. And the reality inside us is how do I calibrate what I see, the danger I'm in, and how I can protect myself or with somebody with me, and then be able to tell the truth when the person next to me doesn't want it to be real. And our adrenaline does something. Our ability to hold on to something depends on how safe we really are. And I think that's very, very important. If you are self-assured in yourself, if you have a sense of your own stamina of being able to stand up for yourself and not care, quote unquote, about what someone else thinks or don't feel threatened by it, it means something very different to our sense of safety. Because I know when I have not been safe, there were times to just shut up. And I know sometimes when it wasn't safe for somebody else, you couldn't keep me quiet. So it's amazing. I don't think I don't think we know sometimes the truth until it's blatant. And the challenge is what are you gonna do right now? What are you gonna do with that? What are you gonna do right now? Yeah. Because something right now has to happen. Yeah. Yes. Game over. Game over. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, sometimes when I when I was thinking about this show today, I was thinking about the fact that sometimes we avoid reality because of what we've dreamt up in our own mind, in our own heart, in our own imagination about a reality that we may face if we go left or if we go right or if we just stay right where we are. And it's at least been my experience that most of the time when I've not wanted to make a decision because I really didn't want to face what I thought would be the reality. When I get to the point of reality, it's kind of like the bully on the playground that falls over. That when I face it, when I face it, it's not nearly as large and looming as I thought it was going to be. And for those challenges that I know that I've had to face, facing it, walking through it, and allowing for the fallout and, you know, you've been with me in some of those situations that were not yes. pretty. Right. But once getting through the fallout, it's kind of like the velveteen rabbit when you become even more real. Right. And when somebody says to me, I don't know how you've lived the life that you've lived, Dana. Some of my cousins on the King side, um, my cousins will say to me, we can't imagine living the life that you've lived. What was that like for you to have that as your reality? And I think sometimes we all learn to cope with whatever reality we are given um, in a lifetime. And it's all we've got. It's all we've got. But then you and I both know that sometimes when we find out that the reality that we had was based on unreality, um, then, it, then the questions become deeper about living, having lived a life based on things that weren't real. Well, that's where personal work comes in. That's exactly. where the psychosis comes in. That's where the psych, the psychic um, crack. That's where people have mental breakdowns. I mean, when somebody faces reality and it's overwhelming, whelming, to have a breakdown is the thing to do. Um, there are more people on antidepressants right now and medication because of anxiety, like you say, with suicide and this, that, and the other thing. To face reality and the challenge of reality, I think a lot of the people that have been stimulated only through social media and TV do not have the nervous system to equip the, with the tools to deal with visceral, physical reality. Mm -hmm in their own loneliness or their overwhelm of being overstimulated. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this, these are real issues that are now chronic in the population.
population of how do we communicate? How do we face reality? How do you, I mean, excuse me, but if anybody thinks the Kardashians are real in the way they look, they have been pumped up, jacked up, recarved, sucked out, cold chilled, everything else. <laughs> Buffed and polished. I mean, you know, you're buffed and polished over and over again. And yes, they have real lives that they wake up to, but nothing on them is real. Their implants, their outplants, their, I mean, you know, every single picture they're covered up. I mean, so, and that's the part. Thank you. That's the part. Yes. Yes. If you want to be a billionaire, that's the bar. Right. We're insane. Yes. I remember the, the first time that you went out to the uh, reservation uh -huh. with me. And you looked at me, I, I believe when we were at the Sundance, and you said, now I understand why you love to be here and why these are your people. And we talked about that, and you talked about the fact because it's so real. It's real being at a Sundance. It's real being in the ceremonies. It's real walking and talking and being with spirit. That's real. Yeah. And the people are real. There aren't any Kardashians out on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. They haven't yeah. made it there yet. No. Um, yeah. But it is projected on the televisions, and it raises yeah. the bar of maybe that's what we want to look like. Maybe that's what we're supposed to look like to get ahead. But right. what is reality? And really real people are a treasure, I believe. Right. Absolutely. And rare. And rare. Yeah. And, and we need more of coming back down into that place of, even for myself, to just allow someone to age in the beauty of what age does mm -hmm. to us, mm -hmm. rather than discredit the fact that that age is dispendable. Yes. Well, even, you know, during COVID when we couldn't get our hair colored and my hair, as you know, is just, it's white. Yeah. And some of you that had classes with me via webinar while we couldn't, you know, make our hair appointment, my hair was half white. As you said, I was starting to look like Cruella DeVille. And personally, I loved it. Uh -huh. I loved it. And Todd loved it. Um, Dane was so freaked out by his mother having white hair because that brought home a reality. That my mother is aging. And that was, that was a reality for him that he wasn't prepared to see me with white hair. Because that brings around the thought, you know, his father has already passed. And seeing me with white hair, the question arises, how soon will it be before she's next? So sometimes when we're really real, and I remember Todd's mother said to me, I asked Todd if you were taking being a grandmother a little too seriously. <laughs> Letting your hair go white and putting your hair up. Um, and frankly, the only reason that I colored it back, you know, this is my natural color back in the day when it was this color, but it was for me, for Dane. Yeah. I would be fully white haired woman right now, loving it, digging it. My husband, he's cool with it. And really, I love Jan, my mother-in-law. She's a magnificent woman, but that didn't really bother me, that comment. For me, it was um, for Dane. Right. And I don't know whether that was right or wrong, but he sure felt a lot better the next time he saw me after I had been to see Shelly, <laughs> who's been yeah. taking care of my hair for 20 years. Wow. Wow. And what is real? Right. The, the reality is, even if you have colored hair, your hair is white. <laughs> exactly. It's still white. Yeah. It's still white. And even if you color it, you're still the age that you are and yes. the credibility of these years gives you who it is that you represent yourself to be right 
I mean, there's that beauty of knowing that I'll, I'm going to be a blonde a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> it looks good on you. Yeah. There you go. And there's that beauty of, you know, I just lost 20, uh, no, I put, lost 30 pounds, and then I put my COVID-10 on, and it's like, oh, no, what's real? The real, it's just, I'm still healthy. I'm still, you know, there's that gratitude. I'm, no matter what's going on right now, what is real in my world, and God bless, I would like everybody's prayers. Bobby just came out of remission, so we're going to start fighting that again. It just happened in the past 24 hours. and But what is real is he and I have the quality of life we have wanted from the beginning of time that we met each other. And it's like, you know, we, we're retired sitting on the porch at the pool enjoying what it is that is created here. And if we don't drink it in and take in the reality that every single day is precious and you fight with it and for it and learn how to really communicate in that way that is real and don't pretend that it's okay when it's not don't pretend it's not okay when it is it's it's and I think that's important too you know don't pretend it's not okay when it is um it comes down to gratitude I appreciate where I am and I make where I am and the challenge of that is to keep it safe in that place of attend to it, have grace with it, be appreciative of the fact that it's even available because right now so many people have nothing, nothing. I mean, scorched homes, scorched lives, it's, it's, uh, that too is real and it's hard. It's hard to know that the reality is so on the spectrum 180 out in all directions mm -hmm. for so many people mm -hmm. and um it takes it takes a moment to, to be honored and honorable to everybody's touched with something right now yeah. everybody's facing something that is so real that is so hard sometimes we can't talk about it so emotional it's too hard to feel but it doesn't mean it's not real Mm -hmm. that Bobby's cancer is back. I don't want to feel it. And it's real. And I'm feeling it. He's feeling it. And all we've got is we face it, deal with it. Because what I have learned, if you hide from cancer, it kills you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to dig in and dig out and go for it. And I didn't know that when I said, let's talk about the topic. Uh, so even in, hey, yeah, let's talk about that. And then to be able to sit here and say, well, there is a reality and I have to face it. And mm -hmm. I'm facing it with that fact of, I think it's even deeper of, I can only face it as it faces me. Mm -hmm. And do and you think that when you're, everything. do you feel that when you're faced with a challenge, like the one that you both are facing, do you feel that the beautiful moments become more beautiful? Yes, because there is a balance in time of this is a moment, appreciate it. There's preciousness. There's a time clock. The conveyor belt is working and it's fast. And it also means if there's a gain, let's cut it out because it's too precious to waste time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it brings the reality to uh, what are we doing? How are we doing it? And everybody has to face the end of the line somewhere. And the reality is that's there. So how do we face the joy or the preciousness of each moment? That the reality is, and this is the reality, we never know what it is until it presents itself. Mm -hmm. So we have to stay agile. We, we, we have to stay attentive. 
you know, it's a beautiful night. It's dark, but the stars are out. And the reality is right now it's a beautiful night, but there's a hurricane coming up the road, you know. Mm -hmm. So this too will change, and what will be the reality for that? Mm -hmm. I do love our conversations. I do too. <laughs> I do too. And here we are already at the top of the hour. Okay. Hard to believe. Uh, past yeah, the top of the hour. I know. <laughs> Keeping it real and appreciating the reality and being awake and aware to the reality. Being awake and aware to the reality of who you are and what's the worst thing that can happen. Well, there are a lot of things that we can perceive as being the worst, but there are a lot of beautiful things that come from being real and experiencing what's real, even in the painful moments. Because sometimes some of the most exquisite beauty happens in the pain. Don't you think, Sand? Absolutely, because that's really real. Exactly. Yes, the passion play. Yeah. Yeah. It's really real. And in those moments, we get humble. In those moments, our egos shift. Mm -hmm. And and the reality of that is precious. Right. It reminds it me. Who we are. It does. It reminds me of um, the when you walked into the children's home on the reservation. Yeah. And saw those little faces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the reality of the exquisiteness of these young lives in their reality. Yeah. In their Absolutely. reality. Okay. The because the, I just want to say the starkness of it was present, but it was filled with their joy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Our perception of somebody's reaction to their reality is our perception. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okie dokie, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Any last words from anybody in the chat room? Well, let's just have a little look-see. Linda Grizak says, thank you for great conversation. Our Jessica says, thank you. I was looking forward to this conversation today. And Lady Hawk says, no, sending you to a video I just received, my neighbor's little boy and our beautiful friend, Marianne Malika, down there in New Smyrna, says, thanking you both for this very real convo. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tara. Blessings be, everybody. Get out there and shine. Good night, everybody. Good night, Sandy.